I'll just speed it up a little bit. Then I, I'm going to talk about HTTP3 today for everyone. So I'm Daniel. Uh, I've been here before. This is my 11th talk at Fostum, actually. And it's, uh, if anything, this sort of audience makes uh, your pulse go up a little bit. But uh, I started doing HTTP a long time ago. I have this little hobby project. Some of you might have known it. I started it, and I work with it daily since then. Uh, it's fun. You should try it. Uh, I work for Wolf SSL doing curl stuff every day. But today I'm going to talk about uh, stuff done within the organization IETF, where I'm uh, participating and working with a lot of other people. So this is what I'm about to try to squeeze in my 45 minutes or so. So we did HTTP 1, 2, and we're going to 3. There are some problems along the way. That's why 3 is coming, right? I'm going to explain a little bit about them. How quick is the solution to those problems? And a little bit about HTTP 3 on top of quick. Some of the challenges with running this tomorrow or now, uh, and something about it when it's about to come, or maybe, I don't know. Uh, so uh, I talked about this last year. <laughs> yes, uh, this is not exactly the same, I'm pro I promise. But uh, you might recognize a few things, because HTTP 3 is still number 3. So um, this is how it started. This is a picture from the 90s. Uh, we started with HTTP 1, actually. It shipped in, uh, well, HTTP 1.1, no, 1.0 actually shipped in 1996. And then it took a long time. And then we did HTTP 2, 2015. And now we're working on HTTP 3. So uh, it's it get a little bit faster. So HTTP is this protocol. You've all seen it. You've all played with it. It looks like that. A client asks for something from a server, uh, requests and a headers, and the server responds with uh, math uh, sort of a code and a header is on the body and stuff. You've seen it. It's, it's there. It's going to be like that in the future as well. So HTTP, we started out this journey over TCP. Well, we still do it over TCP. So TCP, Networking 101, is like a chain of links. Basically, IP packet is connected. So sort of we send them over the wire uh, and, and establish a connection. There's a three-way handshake. Ping, pong, ping, to get establish that connection three ways, three times across the network. And we get that connection, and we can send data over with, uh, in a reliable byte stream, sort of. And it's in clear text. So anyone reading or snooping on the network can see your traffic. TCP, the first RFC, 1981, celebrating 40 years next year. Uh, trusted, we know it, we've used it, it works, it's there. Uh, yep. But, we're talking HTTPS these days, right? So HTTP works over TCP, but we're not talking HTTP clear text. We're talking HTTPS. And do we? Yes, we do, because look, uh, page loads done by Firefox on the internet today, uh, well, this is divided by cont on continents from Firefox data. So you, yeah, there's somewhere around 80%, maybe more, maybe up at 90% of all page loads, HTTPS. Basically, the web is going HTTPS. Uh, the same data from Chrome. Split on, on platforms instead. Yeah, some of them upwards 90, some of them only 70. But we, we, that trend is rather clear. It's growing. The web and everything is going more and more encrypted. We're talking HTTPS. So it's not only HTTP, right? It's HTTP over TCP, but we're talking HTTPS here. So we're adding TLS to the mix. TLS is that transport layer security we add on top, or sort of, so, so, so that we get security. And with TLS, we usually also add another extra round trip to get that TLS connection. One, actually, sometimes four back and forth. Anyway, it depends on version and stuff. So with this, we get privacy and security. Nobody can snoop on your traffic. Nobody can change your traffic. And you know you're actually sure that you're talking to the right server in the other end. Excellent. That's what we need. So this is what we have. We have IP. We do TCP over that. We have TLS to secure that. And we do HTTP over that. HTTPS what we know and used and love and every day, everywhere. So back again, TCP is done over, sorry, HTTP is done over TCP. So we started out, actually, HTTP 1.1, the great improvement to HTTP 1.0 was shipped in 1997. It was a great improvement to 1.0 because we suddenly fixed how we use TCP connections. Now we could reuse TCP connections. We couldn't do that with HTTP 1.0, yay. Uh, but over the years, People come up with, you know, we want to have many images, many JavaScripts, many style sheets, uh, hundreds of objects on every page. Wait a minute, we only have uh, how many connections? Uh, let's come up with new ways to do more connections in parallel. 
So all the browsers today do many connections in parallel, and you can trick it to do even more parallel connections. So we went to that world. We, so now we're into a world with a lot of parallel connections, so many that we have to kill them off really often because there are too many to keep up all the time. So the median number of HTTP requests done per TCP request in Firefox is one. So basically, they're all created, 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 used, shut down, shut down, shut down, created, used, shut down. And, and TCP is really inefficient in the beginning because they have a slow, it has a slow start period. So they never get up to speed. So uh, with an HTTP 1.1 world, we can never use TCP good enough to actually get fast transfers. That's just it. It, it doesn't work. Uh, and we also got this fine thing that called, we call HTTP head of line blocking because we have a finite number of connections, typically six per host name by a browser. And your typical website has many more than six objects. It's a hundred images and style sheets and stuff. So you have to use those six connections to download those hundreds of objects. But on which of those six connections will you put your next request for the next object? It's a really difficult problem. It's like, you know, in the supermarket when you have those line to cashiers, which one is the fastest? Not the one you pick, right? That's, <laughs> that's going to be the trainee or something. Nah, you never know, or, or annoying customer ahead of you. Uh, uh, the browsers and the HTTP uh, clients, they have this problem. And of course, the entire world and everyone, everyone in here too, have come up with fine and, and uh, ingenious ways to work around these problems. Put everything in a single file, put all JavaScript in a single blob, do whatever fun things, invent new host names so that the browser will do many more connections. So yeah, you can be creative. But uh, to sort of combat all those funny workarounds and take a unified effort, we created HTTP2 and shipped that in 2015. So all those funny workarounds into the protocol instead, and now we're going into a world with a single connection to per host, not 48, one. That's much better because now TCP can get up to speed. We can saturate the bandwidth in both directions much better. Congestion control, everything is fine and dandy. Um, we have many parallel streams over that single connection, so we get many more, much better parallelism. But instead, we fell into another trap. Oh, now we've got TCP head of line blocking instead of the previous HTTP head of line blocking. So now we have, typically, we can have 100 streams over that single TCP connection. And when we lose one little packet because we have a crappy network and we need to retransmit that single packet, 100 streams are waiting for that single packet to get retransmitted. And then it gets retransmitted and 100 streams can continue again and then we lose another packet. Uh, everyone has to wait. Not ideal. And at the same time, uh, a long going trend in the internet uh, is this thing we call ossification that's been going on in parallel with everything else. Ossification is this effect that, you know, everything is full of boxes, or the internet is. Uh, routers, gateways, load balancers, uh, Wi Fi routers, uh, whatever. A lot of boxes out there. And they're all installed at some point in time in your networks. Uh, and they run software, and they all know how the network works at the time you install that box, or someone installed that box. Uh, they very rarely actually know how the future is going to be, and they're all afraid of the future. So they know sort of, if it was a zero today, it will never be anything else but zeros. We know that. So, um, and we never upgrade these boxes. <laughs> we buy them and put them in the networks. We upgrade our servers, we upgrade, well, we do, actually, some of us do. Well, every year or so. Or, and the browsers, you know, they upgrade themselves basically every week, sort of, automatically. So the edges, they upgrade. The middle, Ah, it's stuck in time, and they know how the network worked when we got those boxes and installed them five years ago, ten years ago. Uh, I'll just sort of, just to really drive this in. So that's me, and there's the website, and all of those little machines in there, they're middle boxes somewhere. They're stuck in time, and, and their, their mission is to drive the network as the network worked when we installed them. Today, yesterday, a few years ago. This has a fun effect. Fun. Uh, ossification, we call it. And some... Uh, things like, wait a minute, you can do HTTP2 in clear text? Right, you just upgrade to HTTP2. You don't have to do that over HTTPS, in theory, right? Because a lot of these boxes, they know that if you speak TCP port 80, that means HTTP 1.1. So whatever you speak on TCP port 80, those boxes will help you speak HTTP 1.1. So if you speak something else, they will just ruin your traffic completely. This to the extent that no browser today uses it. Uh, and I, one browser in particular, specifically intended to, yes, we were going to support it. 
until they tried. So they figured out that a lot of boxes help you. So no, you have to hide your traffic in encryption to make sure that it actually works. And wait a minute, we can improve TCP instead of doing it. Why not invent a way to send data earlier in the TCP handshake? We can call it TFO, TCP Fast Open. It's an invention from 10 years ago, so excellent. So if you talk to a server before, you can send data in already in the first packet in the TCP handshake, you know, that three-way handshake. Much faster, you can earn, you can gain a lot of latency there. Uh, let's do that. It took five, seven years until all kernels of the three big platforms supported it. Yay, now we can do it on Windows, on Mac, and Linux. The browser started to try it. Does it work? Uh, no. <laughs> Those boxes, you know, they know... They know how a TCP header is supposed to look like. Uh, so if you set the, those little extra bits in the TCP header, it says, try TCP fast open, uh, a number of them will just throw it away. So the TCP fast open turns out to be a, a TCP falls slow open in, in quite a number of times. So now no operating system and no browser enables TFO by default because it doesn't really work across the web. And uh, sort of this list goes on. If you want to try to introduce a new transport protocol, you know, next to TCP and UDP uh, across the internet, it doesn't work either because it, your Wi-Fi router at home, it can only NAT those two protocols and nothing else. So it'll just stop already there. So no, it won't be any new transport protocols either. So we can invent stuff over to HTTP level instead. It, Brotly is a compression algorithm, much better than GZIP for some purposes. Excellent. Uh, wait a minute. A lot of those boxes, they know HTTP compression. That means GZIP. So if you send compression, it'll help you. So, so, it'll, <laughs> so X percent of those connections will simply get ruined traffic because some boxes in between have fixed your traffic along the way. So, now, so of course, the browsers can do broadly, but they only do broadly now over HTTPS connections. So hide it from all those boxes. Encrypted is fine. Uh, so basically, this trend goes on. So this is completely stops future innovation in a lot of these protocols. If you do it in the clear, someone along the way will uh, ruin your day, and it's not going, to be fun. No, not going to be fun. So we need to encrypt more, more and more encryption, make everything a random noise to every box in between, and they don't know what it is, they can't ruin it. So that's way, the way we're going. <laughs> so we need to improve them in spite of this ossification thing. Uh, by simply making sure that they cannot see what you're doing. They cannot sort of, this is the way it's going to be forever just because we did it today. That's uh, one of the things that sort of led to the creation of the quick working group in the IETF. Uh, <laughs> that's the official logo, and I just want to drive a special thing home. Quick is a name, not an acronym. Whatever you think. It's, it doesn't stand for anything. It's a name. Why is it all in uppercase? is that we can shout it, I think. But it's the name, it's not a, it doesn't stand for anything. So a lot of companies uh, immediately took interest in this. Um, they, all of these are, and more are sending people to this uh, uh, working group in the IETF. And uh, it has been a fierce participa participation and uh, activity at, uh, well, since it started in 2016. Um, so this is a new transport protocol, even though I said you can't do it on TCP UDP layer, but still. So this is built again on experiments and, and tests from Google. Uh, pretty much they did it with HTTP2. You remember they did speedy that became HTTP2 eventually in, from the IETF. Now they did their experiments. And to make everything more complicated this time, they call it quick. And let me go back to that. So um, they deployed this already in 2013. So it's been going on for a while. And they, they have a fairly, you might not know this, but they have fairly well-used client and some popular services. Uh, and that makes them uh, an excellent place to do you know, these wild, wide-scale uh, experiments. Does it work, really? A billion clients against our billion servers. So yes, they proved that it actually works, and it improves a lot of things. So they took that to the IETF in 2015. Let's make this a standard instead of us making funny things in our corner. Um, so yes, the IETF agreed uh, with a bunch of caveats and conditions, and it created the working group for QUIC in 2016. Uh, uh, two of the conditions, well, I could basically possibly uh, this first say that. Um, my first line here, Google created QUIC, their version of QUIC, basically sending HTTP2 frames over UDP and sort of 
demuxing it in the other end and inserting it in your HTTP2 stack. Sort of just translate it, send it over UDP, translate it back as HTTP2. And in the ITF, they said, well, that, that is a really weird sort of layer violation. Why would you do that all in just one mushy layer? Let's split it up. Let's make it a transport protocol and an application layer protocol. So we do quick and we do an application layer on top of that. And we need to do, have proper encryption and not your uh, homegrown thing. We're going with TLS. So when you do a new transport, you can do a lot of things. You can fix this head of line blocking problem. I'll get back to how that works. And uh, why not fix that TFO thing I mentioned, send data earlier in the handshake? Now I have a sort of a new chance to fix all those problems we've had in transport since that first RFC 1981. Um, a lot of transport people, they have sort of a piped up list of fun things to do in transport. Woohoo, the chance to redo it. So um, a lot of fun things are coming in. And for example, why tie a connection to your IP, right? We did that back in the 80s, and I don't think anyone really expected the explosion of IP addresses per host. So, you know, when you're walking out from your Wi-Fi to your cellular network, you have two different interfaces in your system and you have different IP addresses, what happens with your connection? In a TCP connection world, you're, that's tied to your IP address, which is tied to your network interface. You have to open a new connection, not with Quick, but it's because it's not tied to your IP. You can it can trans transition between the network interfaces because it's tied to your connection ID. Um, and more encryption, always encryption. There's no clear text version of Quick. The, it's even more encrypted than TCP with TLS because it's fewer parts of the header in the clear. So basically a few clear text packets in the beginning in the handshake, then everything else encrypted. Just uh, uh, encrypted, uh, basically noise to everyone in between. Uh, so this is hopefully going to make it sure, ensure that we can do future development. Hopefully this means that we can make a quick version two in the future without a lot of those boxes knowing and, and drawing conclusions from the traffic patterns because there shouldn't be much of a traffic pattern. So we build this on top of UDP. We pretend basically that IP is, uh, UDP is the IP. So we move everything up one layer. We do everything over UDP, we write a reliable transport protocol in user space, and we're sending everything over UDP. It's a little bit like reinventing TCP and TLS in one layer and do it over UDP. And no, it's sort of, it's not UDP. We're using UDP when it is not UDP. So UDP, you know, you send whatever you want. It might end up in the other end. It could actually change order. Uh, there's no resend, there's no flow control. But, um, but we're not doing that. We're using UDP, so we do have to add all of those stuff on top of UDP. So we add connections and reliability and flow control, and we have streams, and we have security and stuff on top of UDP. So QUIC is a new transport protocol. TCP is out, QUIC is in. So QUIC also then provides streams, for example. So we, what we had before in, for example, HTTP2, we have it in other protocols too, like SSH or SC. TP, we have individual logical streams within the connection. So uh, we can actually send uh, many logical flows with a single connection. Uh, right. Uh, and you can actually start them from both ends, and you can actually make them bidirectional or unidirectional. So a little bit more complicated than before. And possibly the biggest point with these streams is that they're independent. What does that mean? Why sort of they're independent? That means that if, we, if we, we send them, we know what's in each packet when we send quick. If we lose a packet along the way, we know which streams those packets affect. So if we have 100 streams again, we lose a packet, we know which streams are in that lost packet. The other streams can go on. So we, maybe there were two streams affected by that packet. Then the either 98 streams can go on and continue. And just those two streams waiting for that lost packet have to wait. Retransmit that lost packet, and those two streams can go on. They're independent, but internally they're all reliable and in order and everything. So just to sort of illustrate that with some fun image that I could draw. So TCP, I like to illustrate again like a chain with individual links. And here, if you're sending two streams, the green stream and the red stream, if you lose one of those, the green one, 
the red one also has to wait, right? Because it's one single link. If one link is gone, we have to wait until that link is repaired. But in, in Quick, the streams are independent. It doesn't matter if we lose a yellow one, the blue one can go on anyway. They're independent. So that's, that's a transport protocol, Quick. So when we do, we provide a transport protocol called Quick, we put an application layer on top of that, right? And the applications then the application layer gets streams for free because it's in the transport layer. So it could then virtually be any protocol. And when they brought, uh, when the Google first brought this to the IETF, the, uh, the, the first discussion was like, yeah, we should make sure that it works with more than one protocol, not only for HTTP. We should start with DNS and HTTP. Great, but uh, a little time consuming, so we'll just postpone the DNS part, focus on the HTTP one. But <laughs> it doesn't matter. But, but, the intention is there and the, the separation exists. So it is actually an application layer on top of a transport layer. So there will definitely be more protocols on top of Quick once Quick ships because there's a sort of a piped up demand. A lot of people are just waiting for Quick to ship to make sure that they can make their protocols translated over to Quick instead of TCP. So that's Quick. That's a transport protocol. So when we talk about HTTP 3, that's how we make HTTP over this new transport protocol. HTTP is the same as always, right? That's me, and that's the server, and we send the request, and there's a method and path, and, you know, headers, maybe a body, and we get a response and res headers and a body. I showed you in the beginning. That's HTTP, and it's still going to be that. Most people are not going to care about how it's being transferred over the wire. It doesn't matter. This is HTTP for us. HTTP is the same but different. We started out with a protocol in ASCII. We translated it to, to HTTP 2. We did everything binary, and, and we did all the um, multiplexing in the HTTP layer. And now we took away the multiplexing and put it in the quick layer instead. But we still basically HTTP 2-like done over quick. So just b back again to how this sort of translates to a network stack view. This is the IP, and this is the old one, right? HTTP 1, HTTP 2, pretty much the same. Um, right, HTTP2 actually says that you have to use TLS 1.2, but anyway, it's the TLS layer. So, but instead now, we're building on UDP, and we put this huge quick blob there, TLS 1.3, and we had HTTP 3 on that, and the streams have sort of moved down one layer. A lot of new stuff, right? At least in sort of... There's a lot of things to make quick work, but HTTP 3 is not that different than HTTP 2. So if you just look at sort of a basic feature comparison, yeah, we have a different transport, we have streams, we can do clear text, we cannot do clear text versions anymore, but in practice we don't do that with HTTP 2 anyway because of what the browsers do. Uh, the streams are independent, but that's sort of a minor difference. We're going to do header compression and we're going to do server push and possibly better early data, but they're all sort of, yeah, we're doing the HTTP 2-like features, but it's now HTTP 3 because it's over quick. And we're... Uh, Changing the prioritization thing over HTTP 3 is actually completely gone right now in HTTP 3. It is uh, messy in HTTP 2. And uh, in 35 minutes, you can hear a talk with, by Robin Marks about it. Uh, uh, it's a fun subject. But no, you're not going to fit in the room anyway. Um, so is this going to be faster, better, cooler, whatever? Mm. It's, I think it's going to be faster, thanks to Quick, because Quick is going to make your handshakes much faster. Early numbers from Google from uh, years ago when they tried their version show that upwards around 70% of the connections they saw were able to establish in a zero RTT way. Basically, no handshake at all because you'd had the connection with it before. And zero RTT is much fewer RTTs like than five or seven of what you get with TLS and TCP. Uh, and you get early data that actually works, so you should be able to send a lot more data much earlier in the handshake. So yes, it should be a really good latency improvement for, for those first important uh, packets, especially in HTTP and, and such protocols. And the independent streams are really going to be good, especially for you with, uh, with crappy networks, which typically aren't us in the Western world. But uh, the worse network you have, the better quick in HTTP 3 is going to get, I think, in comparison to previous previous protocols and um, how by how much I don't I won't show you any numbers but because um, we're still in, in early days it hasn't been shipped the protocol isn't done the, there is no 
done codes that nobody is actually wanna, uh, willing to stick out their necks and say exactly how much faster it will be or not, so it remains to be seen. Numbers from Google, from Google Quick Days showed that uh, it can be better from a little better to much better depending on your use case and what you're doing. Okay, so how do you get to this world of HTTP 3 over quick that is done over UDP when HTTP as colon slash slash means TCP, right? So if you, um, if you ever try to check the internet, you've seen these URLs in a few places that they're not really possible to replace, right? We can't change these to anything else. We have these HTTPS colon slash slash URLs. We have to work with them. And they, they actually imply that you connect to TCP port 443 with a TLS uh, establishment over, uh, afterwards or on top. So how, uh, how do you get to HTTP 3 from that? Easy. You use this fun header. This service over there. So uh, you have an old service header. So you actually have to connect to the service server with the old style legacy HTTP 2 or HTTP 1 first. And ask, talk to it and you get a server back that says, hey, I'm also available over there for this period of time and I speak this protocol over there. So that's how you're supposed to do this per, per the spec. So, so, the first, so of course your browser won't sort of, it'll do this in the background of course and try. If, if it can do this, it can upgrade and use HTTP 3 the next time you go to that server. Mm. But you also end up in this fun situation that uh, UDP, wide scale, really high speed internet data. That's something new. Most organizations and companies, they have basically blocked UDP already because that's mostly, mostly done for DDoS attacks and stuff. So block it or throttle it. So uh, when you do that, uh, my server is over there and, and your client tries to connect to it, many times it won't work because your organization or your company have blocked UDP. So when you shut down your laptop and bring it home again, it'll work because at home you won't block UDP. But okay, so. I'm sure that browsers and other users, they're going to raise these con connections. Why not just try both, right? Try the old connection and the new connection at the same time. And as I said, it's going to be needed anyway because if, when you shut down your laptop and you bring it home and you open it up again, maybe HTTP 3 works now, maybe it doesn't because someone is going to block it in one of the situations and not in the other. So there's going to be a lot of probing, test testing, raising them against each other. And quick connections are uh, verifying the service certificate anyway, right? So even if you just make a bet, it might be a quick server there. And if it connects, you know, because you validate the server certificate. So you know that you actually connect to the correct one anyway. And there's also another effort in, in DNS. It's called uh, quite a mouthful, HTTPS SVC, which is basically the old service header put into DNS. So you're supposed to look up in the DNS first if you're if you'll be able to connect to the server or which server to connect to when you want to speak HTTP 3. So that's how you're supposed to do it. So, okay, assuming this all lands and uh, how, how will we do this? Will it work? Will HTTP 3 be the best thing ever starting immediately? Uh, so there are a few challenges. Uh, first, there are some things. We do this over UDP. I mentioned a lot of organizations and companies block connections. So, somewhere around 3, 7, 20% of connections from clients to service will just fail because someone along the way has blocked UDP because UDP is bad and it's mostly DDoS anyway. DDoS and DNS. So, uh, so all, all clients then need to have fallback uh, algorithms pretty, and they have to work um, transparently because that's what your users want to use, right? And this also have this, of course, the reverse incentive that since everyone is going to fall back anyway, it's pretty easy to block UDP because most clients will just silently fall back anyway, so it's going to be interesting. And, um, right, it's, it's a challenge for, for the deployment side. If you run, you're, you run up, you're, you deploy your servers, but the traffic, it looks like a DDoS attack. So you, you need to handle that in, in new ways that you didn't do before. Actually, I think the deployment of the service is going to be possibly the most challenging things because you're not going to run things. Your load servers, load balancers, and everything is going to be uh, new, new things. And <laughs> uh, so, okay, it only takes about three times the CPU as uh, before <coughs> service, uh, to, to sort of serve the same bandwidth as you did with HTTP2. And that's a quite a big uh, uh, investment. Maybe that's uh, 
will make you hold it off for a little while. But I mean, it's still early days. And why, why does it do this? Why, how can anyone accept this? But uh, first, it has this amusing situation that UDP is really unoptimized in, in Linux. And you would imagine that UDP is really dead simple. Why would that be more inefficient than TCP? But we've been actually been polishing TCP for decades, right? Because we've used that for high-speed transfers. UDP, eh, not so much. So there's a lot of things to work on to make sure that UDP is faster in the, st in, in the kernels. And for example, we have really crappy APIs for UDP from, from, uh, from user space. So it's, they're really not made for high volume UDP tr speed transfers. Um, that is also being worked on. And of course, there's no hardware offload for Quick. And uh, anyone who knows a little bit about uh, serving in TLS in, in, a, in a big server farm, you have hardware offload to take care of, of the crypto stuff in TLS. Uh, that's not there for Quick yet because TLS is different in Quick. I'll get back to that uh, about now. <laughs> so, um, uh, so when Google took their version of Quick, with, which then confusingly is also called Quick, we call it Google Quick to sort of, but Quick became Quick in the IETF, and they had their own uh, crypto when they brought it to IETF, and IETF said, we can have it like that, we need to have TLS 1.3. This was actually slightly before it became an RFC and everything, but uh, sure, we, we now have TLS 1.3, but TLS is made to be done over TCP. And now to just be a little bit technical here, but we send records of TLS over TCP, basically. And over quick, we send messages because re TLS records contains messages. Basically, it looks like this. I'll just show you a little image. So this is how you do it in, in t over TCP. So you have record, you have to send frames like this with messages inside. But that seemed completely pointless. Why would you have those frames? You don't need them when you do it in Quick because Quick is a new protocol, so we can just send the messages. Fine, that's sort of, get rid of the crap we don't need, just send the messages. Well, apart from the little detail that no TLS stacks have APIs for this. So uh, yeah, we just have to fix all TLS libraries, right? Uh, easy peasy. So, uh, <laughs> and that, they also need a few other crypto secrets ex uh, exposed from the TLS layer to the Quick stack. So. We just need all TLS uh, libraries to be fixed first, too. Sure. I'll get back to that as well. So, and sure, you're right. Uh, all these um, implementations are in user land, right? Which is probably not always a bad thing because it makes it really easy to iterate and try out, right? So, when Google uh, tested it out, the experiment, they, it was really easy to iterate. They could sort of bump their versions every other day, upgrade the browser, upgrade the server, and just try it. It worked fine and sort of, but it also makes, um, makes you as an application author, you have to get married to one of these libraries and hope that it'll stick around for a while. And there's no standard API, so of course you get married even closer to one of these. And you have this uh, kernel user space uh, transition all the time. So back again to the APIs, to the kernel. So how many back and forth, uh, how much time do you actually waste by going back and forth kernel space, user space? Um, so then your obvious question is, will this then be moved into the kernel? Because, I mean, that's where we used to. TCP is there, right? And we're used to having the transport protocols and stuff in kernels. And I don't have the answer for this. Oh, maybe it will. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't think it'll happen soon. I know there are some efforts to do it, but there are also some new fun interactions between QUIC and, like, QUIC and HTTP3, which should be in the kernel and how. And would anyone writing a kernel really want a new sort of TLS implementation in the kernel? Eh, I don't know. Uh, I have my doubts that it'll be a, a fast <laughs> development. So I don't think so in, in near time. So what about tooling? Uh, there's a lack of tooling, of course. So this has a new... <laughs> This is a totally new area, right? We're throwing out TCP. We've used TCP for quite a while, right? TCP dump. Who hasn't used that, right? Uh, no, no, not anymore, right? All those concepts about segment numbers and windowing and stuff. No, that's gone. So now we need, we need new tools. And okay, Wireshark is there, of course. You get it the latest, and you can actually use that today, and it's excellent. And there are tools coming, like QLog, QVis. QLog is a sort of a standardized logging for, for um, quick service and, and implementations in general, actually, and QVIS is a visualizer of those logs. So there are tools coming, but there's definitely a shortage because this is really new stuff. Uh, so yeah, a little bit thin there, a lot of work to do. So, okay, when will this ship? And 
this is actually, so uh, the quick working group has a charter when it says we have some milestones for when we will ship. And it says there it's going to ship in July 2019. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only slightly disingenuous because they actually, uh, or the, the, there's a change suggested that will actually be applied, I think, in, in, in the coming week. And then they will remove the year completely. And just, there's no milestone anymore. But I would say that maybe it'll be around July 2020, perhaps. Uh, I, I've talked about HTTP3 many times, and this is one of these slides I tend to change the most, sort of postpone it, or maybe this time, maybe not, I don't know. It's really hard uh, to tell. There's a lot of strong wills in the working group, and they want to do it right rather than soon, so who knows? Maybe 2021. So there are a lot of HTTP3 and quick implementations. I'd say over a dozen here, but I think there are even more. So all those companies I showed you before. They all have their own stacks, so there's a multitude of them. You can get them in many languages. There's nothing that prevents you from jumping in immediately and start fiddling with them. There are monthly interrupts, which actually proves then that the specifications actually work. Most of these uh, implementations can actually interrupt with each other to a fairly high degree at least. And uh, we're on draft number 25 right now. So what's good? Curl supports it. That's good, right? <laughs> and, or, and if you want to, if you really insist, you can also use one of the browsers. Or if you use one of those Canary ones or Firefox Nightly, you can enable it. I'll show you in a second. Uh, you can also enable uh, it in, in those servers. And there's an Nginx patch that runs with Quiche, which is a quick library so that you can run your own experiments already today. They're also up to date with the latest draft version. And I mentioned already Wireshark can analyze these streams. Um, but not everyone is on track yet. There's no Safari version, and there's no word from these, you know, the big standard open source servers. Uh, I don't know when they're going to do it. Uh, I don't think there are any official news from any of them. And then there's this fun thing. I'm back again to the TLS situation. We, go, we only have to change all the TLS libraries. How hard can that be? Um, yeah, well, that, that's the pull request for OpenSSL to make the necessary change for the API. Uh, 87, 97, it's still, it's still being discussed, so it hasn't been even been merged. So uh, it'll take a while, I think. And then that's about getting merged into uh, OpenSSL Git master until that gets shipped in a release and then deployed in your Linux servers, I think it'll take a while. Um, so how do you want to run this immediately today? Then you just fire up one of these uh, Canary versions of the browsers, and you enter that fun uh, command line option. And if you're a little bit slow and just wait a few more days, I think you can change the 24 to a 25, because then they're going to upgrade to 25. And if you want to do it with Firefox, you just find that little thing in the about config, and you enable it. Easy, and you can uh, find test servers, even if there are basically no one. You can actually go to, uh, to Facebook, and Cloudflare runs some uh, public ones. Other ones, there are just a few test servers. Early days still. You can do it with curl. And I support the latest draft version. You can do the, that server over there version, approach. And uh, I support two different backends. You can pick whichever library you want to use of these two, and gtcp 2 and Kish. And the fallback is tricky, so we don't do that in Curl yet. <laughs> I don't know really how to handle that. Uh, yeah, I'll figure it out. So you can try it. It's fun. Uh, and if you, if you would do that, it would look like this. So you just ask for HTTP 3 instead of uh, anything else, and it'll just show exactly like HTTP looks like. It, there's no difference, really. So just then to show you some of the problems that we have to ship this. So you want to do ship HTTP 3 enabled Curl. When, right? First, we have some specifications. They haven't landed mid-2020, maybe. And then we have these uh, uh, libraries that we are using to do all of this binary stuff. They're all in alpha versions, right? Because the draft versions keep changing. So they're probably be going into ship after the specifications. And then I'm just going to have a few deployed servers before we can do this, right? Only Facebook and, and two Cloudflare servers are probably not enough. Um, browser support would be good. They're actually pretty crappy still. Um, and so I, then I want to fix libcurl, and then we just have to have those TLS library situation fixed. You know, how hard can it be to ship a TLS library API? Uh, and then we can ship curl. It might not be tomorrow. So I'm looking into this um, 
crystal ball, how will this look in the future? So yeah, this will take time. I, I mentioned quite a few obstacles along the way here. So yes, it'll take some time, and I think uh, it will grow a little bit slower than HP2 did, and then HP, I would say that HP2 didn't grow really fast. But uh, Quick is also here for the long term, so I think Quick is truly the TCP replacement, the only ex existing and sort of viable replacement for TCP that has been done for a very long time. And there's a big effort here and a lot of big muscles and big companies behind this. So I'm pretty certain that Quick will become the TCP replacement. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not 2021, but it's going to be there uh, down the line. And the future, that once this is shipped, people are waiting to add more stuff, multipath, forward error correction, un unreliable streams. Uh, so, so you can mix reliable and unreliable streams within the same connection, right? Bring UDP back into Quick. Um, or what, what about partial reliability? Only a little bit. Uh, uh, it's actually sort of pushed for by video people. Uh, and uh, of course, more application protocols. So there's a huge demand of people waiting. Once this ships, there's going to be more work. There's going to be more work on Quick version 2 as soon as Quick version 1 ships. So there's a lot of people waiting to do things. And when, always when I say this, people, a lot of you are still waiting for me to mention something about web sockets, right? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, that's not actually a part of HTTP at all, HTTP 3, definitely not. So it's more of a thing on top. And, and this time we don't fix it either. You could, in theory, fix web sockets exactly as people did for HTTP 2, if you wanted to. Uh, but that's probably not how it's going to happen. It's going to happen in a completely different way, which is a new API and, and things for doing uh, TCP-like things in JavaScript over the web protocols called web transport. Uh, that's a draft for that. Uh, right. Whew. Now you can wake up over there. Uh, um, HTTP 3 is coming. It's going to be encrypted all the time over quick, over UDP. Um, there are a lot of challenges to do this, especially then in the server side, and uh, might come mid-2020. I'm, I'm always the optimist. When I, <laughs> when I talked about HTTP last year here at Fostum, I, I think I said mid-2019. <laughs> Next year, I'm going to... Uh, I wrote a book about it, or a document at least. It's there. It's free. Uh, and I just wanted to say that since the acoustics in here is completely crappy and everyone is going to walk out the second I show you the next slide. I'm afraid the better way to ask me questions about this is uh, out here or in the cafeteria in five minutes. But you can ask me questions now, too. Thank you.